It is a very painful thing to remember Asaba Masaka. Asaba Masaka, seeking healing. A lot of Nigerians don't know what happened. 7th October 1967, a lot of atrocities happened in the land of Asaba. Nigerian soldiers committed a lot of atrocities. That is goodbye till we meet no more. During the Afro war, Nigerian soldiers gather all the male child and adults in Asaba and massacre them all. They kill many, many people. They kill both the adults or the male child from inside Asaba. 1970, Anye Biakai Jezu Aya, Nigeria. Biabulewu. Anya Mara Nobo, a game of death, Kaiba Nimia. In remembrance of Asaba Massacre, on the 7th October 2022, we'll be sitting at home in entire Biafra land. On that day, it is expected that all schools, all markets, all churches, all banks will shut down for the remembrance of Asaba Massacre. Anybody will hear my voice making talk to a brother, making talk to a sister, making one in children, making one everybody, where they close to them. This order is coming from Biafra spokesperson Simon Epa. Asina, Nti Adahan, Rihe, Ebubisi, Isi Soroya, Intimisi, any year, when they hear water, as they cut head in, as they go cut ear, full arm. They open fire. Papa, 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 where will you go? Machine gun, that will be our people. And they were slaughtered in thousands. Welcome, my amazing viewers. Thank you so much for joining me on my program once again. I appreciate you wherever you are joining from. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please kindly subscribe to my channel. Click the notification bell so that you be notified each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you so much. And remember, Mr. Chairman, my distinguished colleagues, invited guests, and the Joint Committee for the opportunity to speak to you. And also to apologize my not being here the last time this committee sat, it was impossible to be here. I, I traveled out of the country uh, and it was impossible to come back. Secondly, I was also uh, slightly indisposed and I apologize for not coming, not out of any disrespect. Uh, we have the utmost uh, regard and respect for this uh, the Senate of the Federal Republic and this committee also. And also, uh, if it were possible, I would have come, and I sincerely and, and passionately uh, uh, apologize for not being, not, not being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you have uh, rightly guided uh, in your introductory remarks, uh, I want to have a brief uh, to, to this distinguished uh, uh, joint committee and to the, to the Senate of the Federal Republic. Mr. Chairman, yes, I do, uh, very strongly, and to, without mincing words, uh, the upstream is in real difficulty, absolute real difficulty. And this is uh, very easy to see where we are coming from. So, Ch Chairman, the act of bandas and thieves have brought down our production from what we knew last year to today hovering around 1.2 million barrels per day. Mr. Chairman, it is not true also, let me clarify, that it is not true that the difference between 1.2 million barrels and our potential budget level of 1.8 is stolen, no. Because of the act of bandas, Mr. Chairman, our major trunk line, the trans five, five line, the NCTL, were all shut down. Because no one will continue to produce when you know that those production will not get to the terminals. And to be very precise, Chairman, we have never seen this level of escalation throughout our operations. Yes, there are issues around oil thieves, theft. There are issues around bundles. In the last 20 to 22 years, it didn't start today, no doubt, Chairman. But I can confirm to you that the scale that we are seeing today is not precedented. We can give technical explanations, Chairman. 
why would it be so this time around? Prices of crude oil is so high in the market today that there's every incentive for oil tips to operate. Now, it is not just the ordinary illegal refineries that we see, or some of the connections that you see. Now we are seeing a scale that is of uh, proportion that uh, clearly is going to export. And I will explain this, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is what we are dealing with. And it's enormous, and I've invited some of the committees to go and have a direct view of what is really happening and the intervention that is going on. Mr. Chairman, if you have a copy of the document I, I circulated, I don't know if the committee chairman has a copy of this document so that I can speak to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sec Secretary, where is it? Can you do it quickly now? The chairman is waiting. You see page four of this document, Mr. Chairman, uh, it tells you the story of the decline in production from as high as 1.68 in January 2022 to the current low level of 1.22. Uh, this is clearly not connected with the extreme security situation we have. And of course, it's associated consequences. Because when you start losing production, it is only natural that no one would put back his money into it. And therefore, there is gradual underinvestment. Because we do not have the cash flow, and your partners will not put their money into it when they know that you are producing for a third party. And eventually, a combination of the necessity to technically shut down because you risk two things, spillage and also delivering crude to the wrong people. And the associated functionality issues are brought up issues around integrity of the asset itself. Chairman, as we speak to you, in the last six weeks, I don't know if there's a very distinguished member from, uh, from River State, there's a spill site in Bordeaux community as we speak now, we are unable to clamp it. It has been flowing in the last six weeks. Yes, of course, there are so social issues around the community, but the reality is that if you don't clamp that line, you cannot bring back the Transnembe pipeline. And if you don't do that, you are losing 120,000 barrels per day, Mr. Chairman. This is in addition to the hundreds of illegal refineries and connections that are on that line. We have put up a structure of security, hovering around our partners, the, all the government security agencies, and a private contract, a set of private contractors by region, and I, I can speak to you if you wish, Mr. Chairman. A set of private contractors that will harmonize our interventions between the government security agencies and the, and the ground realities that we face to bring this down. There are some statistics I'll show with you whether this has worked. But the only way you can prove it has worked is to get back the production. But we know what has happened, Mr. Chairman. Today, if you look at page, I'm sorry, I have to move forward and backward on this document. If you look at the slide where you have the interventions that we have done, just one. Yes, because of the, you know, the PowerPoint, you say that's the problem of PowerPoint. You know, when you know, it goes under this, I'm sorry. So I don't know if this, uh, if I can just quickly, you can follow me. It's important for you to follow me, sir, so that I can explain myself pr properly. Can I just page them quickly? This is number four, five, so that to the bottom. Six, seven, eight.
sorry, Mr. Chairman. So uh, on page uh, four, you will see the gradual decline of production simply associated with the security challenges and its implication on, on investment. And ultimately, we ended up shutting down the brass terminal, the Focados terminal, and the Boni terminal. All of them are practically doing zero production today. The combined effect is that you have lost uh, 600,000 barrels per day when you do just reality check backwards to where we're coming from. And I'm also happy to say that uh, we will clamp, the, clamp up the, the border incidents and, and potentially bring back the, the TNP in the next two to three days. And also by the seventh of this month, we're also uh, very positive that we can restore production from the Focados terminal. This is uh, clearly connected to the many security interventions that are going on. And I would believe that uh, after, this, after this recovery, we will now continue to build on those, uh, those, those opportunities. So, Chairman, I've shared a quick, before we got here, I asked them to give me an update of all the outcome of the security interventions. You have two sheets of paper that were just brought when I got here. And I would like you to refer to them, Chairman. And it, was, it, it also addresses the scale of the trouble that we have around our assets. Mr. Chairman, we have deactivated 395 illegal refineries. And I will show you what this means in the pictures that you see subsequently. We have taken down 273 wooden boats. We have destroyed 374 reservoirs. I will show you what those reservoirs mean. 370. It's enormous, Mr. Chairman. We have destroyed 1,565 metal tanks, Mr. Chairman. And we have seized over 49 trucks and burned them down, raised them down, because there's no point taking them anywhere. These are dugout pits, 898 dugout pits so far. And I'll show you what is some of the pictures so that I can demonstrate what they really mean. And I know Chairman uh, Upstream and some of the Upstream committee members who have seen it, they really can have seen what this really means. And there are ovens where this cooking takes place. 1,219 ovens taken down, Mr. Chairman. The implication of this, Mr. Chairman, is that you have a disaster zone. There's no better way of describing it, sir. But in terms of uh, uh, stoppage of production to environmental issues. And this is worse disaster than what you hear around the Ogoni land in terms of scale. And this is what we are dealing with. Today, we are not really dealing with uh, whether or not there's uh, the devastation of the environment, just to stop it first, before we even face the consequences, but there will be consequences. For sure, I don't know, uh, distinguished, uh, John, distinguished uh, John manager, uh, manager here, please. Uh, he knows today that fishing, agriculture, is almost decimated to nothing now in very many communities, almost absent. So this is the next worry that we will face as a country and also these descendants. And I would like us to ask you to support us to see how we can take the next steps. Is uh, to say the least, Mr. Chairman, it's just a calamitous situation. But we are not hopeless. We are pulling down all the illegal refineries. We are pulling down the connection. As a matter of fact, Mr. Chairman, just three days ago. Just three days ago, Mr. Chairman, we found a connection by the help of these private contractors that were put in place. Running four kilometers from our major trunk, trunk Focados line into the sea, four kilometers into the sea. And with a loading port that has probably operated in the last nine years, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And if this is just one, I do not know how many more are there, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> when you do, yes, yes, distinguished Senator Kaita, when you have an insertion, it doesn't go to meter. It doesn't. It's before the metering point. After the production point, before the metering point, is, your terminal will read that 100 barrels left the production point, only zero got to the terminal. That's metering. Yes, you know it is zero. So what's up? what use is zero? So it's not an issue of metering, Mr. Chairman. Yes, metering is a problem. Uh, everybody has highlighted it. 
there may be incorrect metering, inefficient. Yes, that's correct, but this is not what we are dealing with, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when you look at the next slide that I shared with you, it's very obvious that the interventions are working because when you see the decline of the illegal connections from January 2022 to date, it's declining, but it's not gone. What the death data is showing you that there are still illegal connection activities going on, but it's of low scale. It has been degraded. And that is why if you go to page 9, I guess we have num numbered them. Where you have the best pictures. So, Chairman, this is what you are dealing with. Page 9, page 10, page 11, page 12. And I want you to particularly pay attention to page... Yes, uh, to page 12, page 13 or 12. I think I jumped one. Page 13, where you have these people. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you can see this. Mr. Chairman, this, as you can see from the date, this will... Mr. Chairman, you can see that it is professionally done. It is a connection that is obviously not even going to an illegal refinery. It is also, we have also traced it to the sea. When you go back, Mr. Chairman, all the previous pages before that page, it just tells you when we say illegal refinery, what it means, page 10 and 11. Mr. Chairman, sometimes, we can't, we, we, not just sometimes, every day in our major trunk line when they are operating, and we still do, we take an overflight in the morning between 6 and 6.30 before pumping starts. Mr. Chairman, we, visibility is very clear. We see those activities going on sometimes unperturbed, unchallenged, and you'll see it. But I'm happy also that this has been degraded through the actions of our government security engineer in the last uh, three to two to three months, and the escalation of those interventions in the last one month, with interventions of the private security that we have taken, and also the Nigerian Air Force, and we are seeing gradual respect for the state, because it's actually a lack of respect for the state. And this, has, this, is, uh, this is pain of, this is pain of Mr. Mr. Chairman. And the net result, as I've said earlier, Mr. Chairman, is degradation of the environment, of scale that we are, we are still carrying out investigations to see what does this do all this mean, what do we do. But first and foremost, we need to stop it, and we are stopping it. And to do this also, it has many dimensions, Mr. Chairman. It's not just enough to see it as a security problem, it's not. It's also a social problem. We're also intervening in making sure that those members of community, community, and they are not the culprit. And I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, yes, you can operate in this environment with us, local knowledge, but it has now turned into an industry that everybody is participating, just like the goal in Zampara, that everybody goes there. So today you find people from all parts of the country, and some of them even unknowingly taken there as employees of refineries, unfortunately. They don't even know. So many of the arrests have confirmed that some of these people don't even know that they are in the in wrong place. They were told that they are, they are employed to work in a refinery, a titular refinery or modular refineries, because they are not refineries. So, Chairman, this is what we are dealing with. But what we, did we do, apart from this security intervention, is to escalate, escalate it to the global space. Because crude oil transactions, as well, now, apart from the cooking that they are doing, and I'm sure that many of the diesel that we use in all our homes here, until very recently, may be coming from those illegal refineries. I can tell you this. But you cannot sell crude oil in the international market without involving banks. It's not possible. So we have taken this struggle to the international platform, and we have asked that the United Nations declares 
for chests of stolen crude oil as black diamond, sorry, blood diamond. And that worked in some jurisdictions. And also, because uh, sometimes when, you, when people take crude, stolen crude oil to markets, they have no way of validation. We have also created a portal where any legitimate transaction in Nigerian crude oil can be validated. So, so anyone who doesn't do is deliberately either avoiding that process or is part of the problem. And that's why we have also appealed to the international banking platforms to engage us and to help us so that we can, because these transactions have identification. You cannot pay for a million barrels of oil except through, you go, through a bank. The bank will ask for the necessary documentation, which includes uh, origination documents. And those origination documents can be, can be validated in the platform that we have created, which is what you see on slide 13. We have created a platform that people can validate this. And also report any stolen crude or any activity that is illegal. And I'm happy to also say that uh, the same members of communities that people think they are part of it, we have gotten enormous reports from them that the government security agencies are now working on. And it's also of some of the arrests that we're able to, able, to, able to do. Mr. Chairman, I, I know for sure that uh, this is, uh, is something that uh, probably is the first line of priority for our country. We need to resolve it, not just because it's a revenue matter, but because we are creating a huge social problem in the areas that we operate, in terms of uh, calamity of uh, environmental devastation. And more than anything, money is going into the wrong hands. A cargo of crude oil today will cost $90 million. Anyone with $90 million, if he chooses, none of us will sleep in Abuja. This is the reality. Mr. Chairman, it needs the help of all of us, but I must also uh, congratulate the members of our security forces for the enormous work they have done in, the, in, the, in, the, in recent times, and we know that this, this will abate uh, sub subsequently. Mr. Chairman, secondly, uh, fuel supply, I think this will interest all of us, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if I can continue. Yes. Yes, <coughs> yes Mr. Chairman, fuel supply. These are what we call the ember months, October, November, December. Typically, consumption rises in November because people, people move uh, uh, extensively. We are out of the wet season, so local transportation increases. So typically, you will see uh, you'll have more demand for petroleum during what we call the ember months and the potential uh, glitches in, in the distribution system. I can confirm to you, Chairman, in uh, slide 16, that we have sufficient supply in our hands, and our, our plan up to December and into January is robust. And I can confirm that we do not see any supply disruptions happening between now and November. And as, as we speak now, even if we don't import any liter of fuel, we have 29 days of sufficiency in our hands at current evacuation level. And I must emphasize, Mr. Chairman, is evacuation. I do not know the, we, we do not know the consumption of this country, Mr. Chairman. And evacuation is simply what, what the volumes that have left all the depots. And this is validated. I don't know if my colleague uh, from the authority has come here. We keep record of, they keep record of all the evacuation. That's every truck that leaves any fuel depot, the quantity it takes, the driver, the phone number, everybody, destination fuel station, it's all kept by the, by the authority. And I can confirm to you that the numbers I present here is what you see, is the evacuation from the depot. And evacuation, as we all know, may not be consumption. When you evacuate, we have no control. And I must say this very clearly, Mr. Chairman. If you go to the next slide, 18th, I number did 18, where you have the map of Nigeria and other countries. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, our subsidized price of petroleum motor spirit in our country is between 162 and 165. That's a, a problem. By the way, 
uh, you will see 170, 175 in this. So we own it up. Mr. Chairman, 162, if you are selling at 162, and look at the country surrounding Mr. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. This is the reality. This can be validated because it's in a global web page where you can validate these prices. Globalpetrolprices.com. Do the combustion, you will get these prices. So as long as we are in this condition, I remember Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, we know there's huge difficulty in our social environment today. The price of petroleum affects everything, of energy, anywhere in the world. We are seeing this now uh, unfolding across the globe, even in Europe. Countries are taking steps to see how they can contain and control the, the cost of energy. Ms. Ms. I don't know if I, do I stop, sir? Should I stop or what? Okay, okay. Countries are make, taking steps to contain and control the cost of energy across the globe. What is supply and is pricing? So we're not any different because the subsidized regime we're having today is simply reacting in a different manner. In some Western countries, in European countries, they have reduced taxes to, to zero in some countries on petroleum. It's just another subsidy because money you would have paid, you didn't pay. So everybody is doing something, some form of subsidy, somehow to contain the, price, the cost of energy. But it also has a problem for you. That means uh, you must be wary of the realities around you, uh, which is that you have very poor countries around us. They will have no access to foreign exchange in the current situation that we are seeing. And it's very, very difficult to contain cross-border smuggling. But I also confirm that enormous work has been done. This has been uh, clearly uh, reduced, but it's not eliminated, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure you have seen so many reports in the media where the customs have made arrests of people trying to take products across the country. And in some countries, they actually call it Nigerian market. But it's real. And we have also seen, Mr. Chairman, that any time we bring down supply or evacuation to below, in current times, Mr. Chairman, to below 65, and we have seen it happen two, three times this year alone, any time for any reason the supply comes down below that level, evacuation comes down level, you will see trouble in the streets. And you will see the queues. It will come up. So, Mr. Chairman, the figures you are seeing reflective of our evacuation may not be our consumption, but definitely it is a level at which if you don't operate at that level, you will go into the trouble that you are seeing. Very simple that you can see in Abuja today, sir. I'm sure you have seen the pockets of uh, uh, queues just today, Mr. Chairman. And what caused it? Because trucks could not cross Lapai here, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if there's a uh, single senator from Niger said you, you, you know this, sir. Okay, then. you know you, have, you know this, yes. As we speak now, there are trucks that are trapped there for three days. As we are coming here, we are making efforts to see how we can intervene. It's not, our, it's not NMPC's role, but we are doing it. So that we can clean those roads, we can do some patchwork so that the trucks can cross. So at the moment you have a minor disruption of this distribution system, you have trouble. And this is reflected in the manner in which evacuation takes place in, in the fuel, in fuel, fuel depots. The last three, four days, anytime you have holidays, we do everything possible to make sure that the, uh, evacuation takes place at the depot so that you don't have this uh, build off that can happen. But I'm happy this is, go this is going to go away uh, this evening or later by tomorrow morning because we are, we are able to clear the, uh, the, the, the exit. Mr. Chairman, I would like to just take you to slide 20 just to show you, and I'm not going to bore you with data, if you look at the last row, Mr. Chairman, the second to the last row, from 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, up to 2022, we have seen increase in evacuation since 2015. There can be two explanations, Mr. Chairman. One is that we have genuine growth in our economy, we also have a reality that power supply is a major issue. Growing population, and people are resorting to some of these uh, uh, 
power, uh, power generators that run on petrol. And also the rice revolution, uh, the single chairman, uh, chairman, senator from Niger State will bear that 70% of all the power generators used in, in the pumps that brought the rice revolution operate on petrol. And therefore you have a scale up of uh, consumption that you didn't see, that didn't exist before. And of course, the economic realities around us, our neighboring countries, is also an additional cost. So when you combine all this, you will see this growth going. So for us, our responsibility is to make sure that we, by batch of the provisions of the petroleum industry, are to continue to guarantee energy security. Well, that's what we are doing, and it's our, it's our role. And we do believe that uh, the pricing of petroleum, the Senate, in its wisdom, and, and as far as the legislation, uh, the Appropriation Act 2022 and 2021, to the effect that we should sell prices at this so It's our job to deliver this for you. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to bore you with it. slide 21, just to show you the evacuation. It just tells you how, how it uh, oscillates between uh, between periods. So, nothing to, to bore you with, including slide 22. It's telling the same story month by month. And anytime you have a drop, you have a problem. This is really the point that. Uh, uh, that, that you are seeing. Mr. Chairman, I don't want you to bore with the rest of the data, they speak for themselves, but what is also critical, Mr. Chairman, is that when you go to slide 25, where you have evacuation, and I can confirm to you that the authority has data around all the evacuation by state, by fuel station, by the trucks that left the depots, and state by city, you see. And by the way, these figures they are seeing is also a replication of uh, of delivery of subsidy by state. That's really what it means. Well, it's not pro rata, this is by population and economic capacity. And it's, it's very obvious. And sometimes, and unfortunately also, Mr. Chairman, uh, these are the averages. But unfortunately, it's also reflective of states that are connected to borders. Mr. Chairman, I would like you to look at the slide 26, the fuel stations by states. And you see that some states have disproportionate number of fuel stations. And one example that we we'll just point out so that we can, uh, I, I just without missing words, and I think taking it from the border states. And I'll take two examples, they should suffice. When you go to Shaki, who is, I don't know if it's from your state, You have close to 100 filling stations. You don't need more than five stations in that vicinity. In Casina State, the uh, single senator Okaita, and I'll mention it, so that just to sort of show that this is not a, a it's, it's, it's everywhere. In Jivia, between 10 kilometer 10 into Jivia, I'm sure we all know. Jivia, I'm not sure Jivia requires more than three filling stations. You have over 90 fuel stations between kilometer 10. And this is true of every state that has a border. Every border city that you have in this country have this disproportionate number of fuel stations beyond their needs. But I'm happy also to say that there's a regulation that has limited establishment of new stations close, close to, the, to the border states. And I think this is something that should interest the National Assembly. Maybe it can be a legislative matter for you to, to consider. But these are the realities that you are seeing, how we can reduce them or how we can discourage it can be a matter of legislation, legislative uh, considerations. So, Chairman, slide 28, uh, refinery updates. What are we doing with our refineries? I have said it the last time I engaged you. Potago Refinery Rehabilitation is on progress, it's ongoing. You will see the scale of activities that we are, we are, we are doing. We are very confident that they will deliver this refinery to completion. And also active work is going on. I invite you at, at your convenience to, to join us to come and see what is going on. We are also mobilizing into a uh, refinery. A uh, contractor has, uh, has mobilized to site. And I also invite you to join us so that we can see what is going on in, in worry refinery. A mobilization with Kaduna will now follow, follow suit. Uh, this is clearly unavoidable because uh, is now you have access to fend for ourselves, Mr. Chairman. We do not have recourse to state funds anymore. We are borrowing to fund this infrastructure rehabilitation. 
Mr. Chairman. And we are very confident that we will we'll deliver on this. And I invite you at your earliest convenience to join us to see exact work that is going, going on. I do not want to bore you with data, but you will see it for yourself. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, then on gas, Mr. Chairman, I do not have the slides here, but I will speak to you, Mr. Chairman. Gas is the major fulcrum of the energy transition. And Mr. Chairman, the world has accepted gas as the transition fuel. And for us, we are a gas country. We have never paid attention to it. And we have always looked at the, the easy revenue that comes from oil. And therefore, we neglected it for many years. But I'm happy that the new focus by our country in gas development is paying up. We are delivering on the gas infrastructure projects, particularly the OB3 pipeline, which will connect the east and the west and also enable gas delivery to the eastern part of the country. And one element is left now, Mr. Chairman. There's a technical situation we are, we are dealing with, and we know we'll cross it by the end of December. And what, that's what we call the River Niger crossing. We are, we are doing tunneling the River Niger by two, two kilo, three kilometers, am I right? Two kilometers, 2.7 kilometer line. 2.7 kilometer line, and once that is completed, you know, stories around shortages of gas in the Lagos area and the east will become history because we will now have capacity to add additional 2 billion uh, scope of gas into the, into the network. And it will also enable delivery to the ongoing uh, AKK pipeline, uh, which is also at a very, very high level of uh, completion. And we have promised that we will deliver gas on this line by the first quarter of next year, and this will happen also. Mr. President, we will may not complete the project, but we will deliver gas on it. As you are aware, uh, gas projects are always done in in, uh, in 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 phases. There are equipments that you can wait and deliver subsequently. Some of the relay stations that you, uh, until you have a need, you don't do them, and that's why we have scaled up. We have appropriated the process, and we will deliver this project also. But ultimately, what will this do is to increase domestic gas supply to up to eight billion scope. And once that is done, then the gas-based industries will come. But nobody will put his money except they are sure that gas will come. And that's why we could not even progress with the power plants we plan to construct in, in Abuja, Kaduna, and some of the power plants that are already in place, they can't get gas because we are not able to complete this infrastructure. And we are focused on completing this infrastructure so that gas can be delivered and businesses can now take decisions to construct power plants. We didn't stop at that. We're also scaling the power supply, as you are aware also, Mr. Chairman, a number of issues around the transmission system, which is being also handled uh, through the, the Siemens initiative, and we think the ones that is put the bottleneck uh, power delivery into the network will, uh, will also become is that. As, we, as I can also share with you, Mr. Chairman, we have two power plants that are now operating at less than 50% of their installed capacities because there is no transmission capacity for us to deliver the gas into the network. We know this, but the bottleneck king will, will help and, and ultimately we can have more power into the network. You may also have seen a number of conversations around export gas. Uh, and this is also uh, clearly in, a, in the best national interest for us to do this. The international market is looking for gas uh, more than any other time today. And we are being engaged by multiple stakeholders across the globe to see how Nigerian gas can come into the international market. One of the frameworks that we are working on is the brass to Morocco pipeline, which will pass through 11 West African countries into Morocco and, probably, and, and they end up in, uh, in Europe. And also to extend the Trans-Nigeria pipeline into Niger Republic and into Algeria and also land into Europe if, if sufficient quantities are, uh, are available. Uh, once this is done, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, all we need to do is to sustain what we are doing on the NLNG uh, project which is to scale up supply to the LNG. Currently, gas supply is at 70%, connected to the security situation that we have in the country today, and scale it up so that it is at optimum, the trend one to six that we have, come to optimum production at 98%, once we're able to restore the lines, uh, particularly the Focados line, and, and also to continue the progress that we're having on the trend seven project. It is going on course. And as a matter of fact, uh, our partners and us are engaging to see how we can also uh, progress with a trend eight possibility because it, it, the market is still there uh, up to year 2030 to 2040 gas will still be relevant and you will still see investment in the gas uh, gas, gas gas business 
On the back of this, Mr. Chairman, there are quick wins around gas. Uh, we're also working with a number of partners to bring uh, floating LNG facilities uh, so that you know, ultimately, because they are quicker to deliver, they are smaller in scale, and those engagements are going on, and we think we'll get the commitments to make them uh, of value to our country as we continue to uh, develop the upstream uh, oil and gas development in general sense, because that's what the PIA has done also. Uh, partners are now engaging because of the resolution of so many conflicts. The position that the PI has placed uh, this country, now there's robust engagement going on to return to the deep water. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to speak. Thank you so much for your patience to watch from the beginning to the end. I hope you have learned something from the video you have just watched. The video you have just watched is to bring information to your doorstep and for educational purpose. It is not to demonize anybody. Let us watch continuously and see who can be able to make a sense out of every nonsense we are seeing. We must continue. We move. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say. They will kill us. We will kill them. At the end of the day, Biafra is here. Thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please kindly subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell so that you notify each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you. I remember this. Bye bye. See you again.